preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Judy Rubin, chairman of the 92nd Street Y, and it is my pleasure to welcome you tonight for the third of three appearances at the Y this season by Anthony Burgess. We are honored that Mr. Burgess has agreed to read from his work as part of our Poetry Center program and to deliver two special lectures in, in which he explores creativity and expression in literature and music and how ideas and emotions are communicated. The format for tonight is as follows. Mr. Burgess will speak for approximately 45 minutes to one hour, and then he will take questions from the audience. Please be sure to deliver your questions clearly and loudly so your neighbors can hear. Anthony Burgess was born John Anthony Burgess Wilson in Manchester, England in 1917, the son of a music hall pianist father and a singer-dancer mother. He studied music and languages at Manchester University and joined the British Army in 1940, serving in Gibraltar, Malaya, and Borneo as, a, as an education officer. Mr. Burgess began writing in 1949 and shows little sign of slowing down today. Among his more than 50 works of fiction and nonfiction are the novels A Vision of Battlements, The Long Day Wanes, The Right to an Answer, A Clockwork Orange, the Wanting Seed, Tremor of Intent, The Enderby Novels, Nothing Like the Sun, Napoleon's Symphony, Man of Nazareth, The Kingdom of the Wicked, The End of the World News, Earthly Powers, and his most recent work of fiction, The Piano Players. A partial list of Mr. Burgess's nonfiction includes several books on James Joyce, one of which is an abridgment of Finnegan's Wake, Ernest Hemingway and His World, Language Made Plain, The Novel Now, and Flame Into Being, The Life and Work of D.H. Lawrence. The acclaimed first part of his autobiography, Little Wilson and Big God, appeared in February 1987. It details his life up to the moment he began writing for a living, and he is currently at work on the second volume. Mr. Burgess's first love was music as evidenced by his novels with a musical theme, notably A Clockwork Orange and Napoleon Symphony, and he has continued to compose throughout his life. His musical works include Symphony in C, The Brides of Enderby, Mr. W.S., and a song cycle and background music for T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Ladies and gentlemen, the 92nd Street Y is honored to welcome to its platform Mr. Anthony Burgess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. As you see, I brought no notes with me tonight. I'm speaking off the cuff. The notes are all there. Uh, this is the third of uh, three performances, I suppose. I must call them here at the Y. And uh, there is a special reason, I think, for talking and reading as I have done, because I am old, I can't, you, you already know, you know the year in which I was born, I can't deny the fact that I'm old, advancing into the veil of years, and uh, the time has come to think over what I've been trying to do, and uh, what I may yet do in the brief time that remains. I have been haunted all my life uh, by this specter of music, uh, although I have not practiced the art of composition for a living, I've done it in my spare time, and uh, I'm haunted, as I say, not only by the spectre of music, but also by the relationship between music and literature, uh, which is something that uh, not many writers are really concerned about. But first of all, I'd like to evoke the memory of my poor father, who played the piano in a cinema in the old silent days, and I'd like to give you an impression of the kind of thing he used to do. There's the screen, here's the piano. The piano wasn't as good as this. And he would look at the screen and he would try and follow the action.
Of course, uh, this, is a very, this is a very lowly kind of musical activity, and I, in some way, I've never really uh, risen above it. I would say that um, both my father and my mother, who was a singer and dancer, had never really asked themselves the great question, you know, what is music about? And it's not a question we ask ourselves very much. These days, we're surrounded by music. We're overwhelmed by music, which can't be turned off. Uh, I sometimes try and compose a little music in airports, and I see other musicians, you know, desperately trying to con violin parts, but the music goes on, and nobody knows how to switch it off. Yet the question, you know, what does music mean? What's he trying to say to us? Is never really answered and not really properly asked. I think that the medieval ancestors of both my father and mother, in the sense that uh, they were members of the Catholic Church, uh, comes fairly close to a situation in which the question need not be asked. I mean, this kind of thing. Uh, as you know, the music of the East is uh, not music which contains harmony or counterpoint. It's merely a melodic line uh, with a kind of percussion accompaniment. But uh, even in medieval Europe, music was like that. Uh, there was no question of big chords, diminished sevenths, augmented sixths, and so on. There was just a plain line of music. Etc. But unfortunately, some voices couldn't reach that high. Uh, the altos couldn't reach as high as the sopranos, and the basses couldn't reach as high as the tenors. And so what resulted was something they called organ, which was like this. Which is rather Chinese sounding. But uh, in the Middle Ages, that seemed to be satisfactory. It seemed to suggest a kind of image of order. You know, you know there's stability. Stability. But if you play that scale with these, as we say, fourths, one, two, three, four, you get this. You come to that combination of notes. could not be accepted. It denied stability. And it was called the modus diaboli or the devil's mode. All that they could do with that was either to flatten the top note, that was all right, that was fine, or sharpen the bottom note. And the mere act of introducing a flat or a sharp meant that they were onto a key cycle, and that led to the key cycle we have today. You know what I mean. 12 major keys, 12 minor keys, all represented here on the piano. Now, the interesting thing is that this interval, which we call the tritone, or the augmented fourth, is pretty well the basis of modern music. In other words, modern music, to some extent, denies stability in the way that the music of the Middle Ages did not. So that when we come to, say, Wagner's Tristan and his author in the 1860s, we have an opening about which whole books have been written. This. If you examine those chords, you see they're based on that forbidden progression, that forbidden tonality. Or here. into words, except by some such metaphorical expression as it lacks stability, it's eerie, it suggests some diabolic force, it's significant that it is the sound of an ambulance or an airy siren, and so on. And yet, if you come to uh, a fairly modern composer like Debussy, uh, say a work like La Prémie d'un Faune, which uh, orchestral musicians call an afternoon on the phone. The, uh, <laughs> it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be about Malarme's poem, in which a fawn is sitting in a glade in Sicily and dreaming of nymphs, and finally there's an image of the goddess Venus, the goddess of love, who overwhelms him. This is what the music is supposed to be about, but it can't be about that, but it's only notes. 
The opening is this, as you remember. What that is about is this. It's that old forbidden interval, the, the modus diaboli in the devil's mode. If you come to the middle part of the music, where the, the goddess Venus appears, you get this, or something like it. serve to indicate that uh, there is a kind of meaning and uh, the only meaning we can suggest is one very very vague and very very general which is something to do with stability certain chords certain sequences of notes are stable others are not now after the middle ages of course music really got going the music we listen to today the music of mozart haydn beethoven Wagner, and the rest is highly complicated there's no equivalent to it in the east and uh, it is made out of harmonies which were not known in the Middle Ages. Yet what is this music trying to do? I think that uh, the music that says most to society is always based on the dance. That the dance itself is a kind of symbol of social stability and a symbol in a way of sexual stability. A man and a woman dancing together uh, are executing a kind of ritual sexual dance. They're touching each other in some cases. They're embracing in some cases. They dance round the ballroom, and the very circularity of the ballroom is a symbol of the, the cycle of the seasons, the cycle of life. When men are wearing uniform, they suggest war, but war has been tamed merely into a symbolism, into ritual. And the music that we still regard as the center, the basis of our repertory, is somehow based on the dance. I'm thinking of um, works like the symphonies of Haydn and Mozart. Uh, what is a symphony by Haydn or Mozart trying to say? Well, the rhythms are dance-like, they go on, they don't vary in tempo, and they're totally, I think, impersonal. I don't think when you listen to a Mozart symphony, you get this image of Amadeus that Peter Schaffer gave us in his film or in his play. There's no personality there. The music is about society. And particularly, it's about the particular society called the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, what the music of Haydn and Mozart is presenting to us is this stability of an empire. But when Beethoven comes along, there's no more stability. You only have to think, say, of the situation with Napoleon raging all over Europe, Beethoven not quite sure whether, whether he ought to dedicate his third symphony to Napoleon or not, but Beethoven certainly, for the first time, shoving himself into the music. I won't play it on the piano, but you know the Fifth Symphony, which goes da 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 and so on, and maintains that kind of ferocious rhythm throughout the whole movement. Then, towards the end, that rhythm stops. And we hear an oboe saying da 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 and then the rhythm starts again. Now, why? Mozart wouldn't have done that. Hyde wouldn't have done that. There's a personality coming in. And uh, this personality is also presented in Beethoven's music by, you know, sudden sforzandi, uh, sudden transitions between forte and piano. And perpetually a desire, it seems to me, to call on something other than the notes, to call on one's own personality. This, of course, is the essence of romantic art. This is Byron. And it's more particularly Berlioz, extra Berlioz. Uh, he wrote the fantastic symphony in 1830, which was only three years after the death of Beethoven. Why did he write it? He wrote it not for a musical reason, but for a purely literary reason, or rather for a, a personal reason tied up with a literary reason. As uh, some of you know, uh, in the late 1820s, there was in Paris uh, a theatrical event which shook the French artistic world. Uh, France and England had been at war, now there was peace, and the French and English were learning from each other. The French were using English toilet soap, and the English were adopting the French cuisine. But more particularly, English drama was coming to Paris. And in the 1820s, a company of players 
from Covent Garden in London came to Paris and they presented Shakespeare's Hamlet. In the company was a young girl called Harriet Smithson. Uh, she was a revelation to the French. They'd never seen anything like it before. They were used to the rather rigid tragedies of Racine and Corneille and Voltaire. Now they got an actress who appealed straight to the heart. She was Ophelia, she went mad, she drowned herself, and grown men, people like Delacroix, Victor Hugo, Berlioz himself, were leaving the theater sobbing their hearts out. Out of that experience, in a sense, post Beethovenian music began. When Berlioz wrote the romantic, the uh, fantastic symphony, it all seems to me he was like a novelist who couldn't quite find the words in which to express his feelings, so he took a crash course in symphonic music and produced this curiously amateurish but very effective work. You know, you know the story of it, five movements. He gives us a program. He says a young poet takes opium and dreams of his loved one in the first movement. In the second movement, he says a ball. People are dancing and he sees his loved one flitting through. In the third movement, he's in the Swiss mountains, the Swiss Alps, and there she appears again as a vision. In the fifth movement, he dreams that he's being taken in a tumbrel to the guillotine, and just before his head is lopped off, he sees her again. Finally, in the last movement, he's at a witch's Sabbath, and there she appears again. Her theme distorted, she's turned into a witch. Now, this is not music as Haydn or Mozart knew it. This is music which is heavy, heavily dependent on something that is not musical. And I think in a way, you know, that is the story of music from the Romantic period to our own day. Music seems to have to rely on something else than itself. The notes are not enough. After Berlioz had tried to depict in notes a literary situation or an autobiographical situation, it was only left to a man like Richard Strauss in Germany to decide that music could become literature. There was no further need of literature. Music could take over the job. You no longer had to read the many hundred pages of Don Quixote. You merely listened to Strauss's symphonic poem, Don Quixote, which lasts about 55 minutes, and there it all is. Uh, Strauss even said that it was possible to depict anything in music. He said that if you wanted to depict a dining room, you could make a distinction between the kind of lager served, whether it was Czech lager or German lager, through the notes alone. And we do know that in his opera Salome, a highly literary, even biblical theme, everything towards the end can be left to the music the rage of the Tetrarch, the agony of Salome before she is crushed to death under the soldier's shields, even the lopping off the head of John the Baptist. Music has taken over the job of literature. What happened at the end of this period? What happened there, I think, was that it was no longer enough to have literature um, being consumed by music, Bigger themes were necessary, and I think that uh, when we come to the beginning of this century with, say, Arnold Schoenberg, Alban Berg, in Vienna, the same, living in the same empire that Haydn and Mozart had glorified, whose stability they glorified, now all that Schoenberg could do was to indicate in notes that this empire was breaking down. We know that Schoenberg's music is highly structured, highly organized. At least we know that when we read the score. But when we hear the music, we hear chiefly neurosis, breakdown. And we feel that at that point, at the beginning of our century, music can go two ways. It can either go to Vienna, where with the dodecaphonic system, it can represent neurosis, very very appropriate, considering that Vienna was Freud's town, or it can go to Paris and still cling to a literary program, but to turn that literature into something very, very static. I'm thinking of Debussy. Claude Debussy, all his works, or most of his works, have titles. In other words, he's indicating that these pieces of music represent something that is not musical. But he always puts the titles at the end of the piece at least in the piano preludes, you play the piece of music and at the end you discover what it's called. 
Here, though, a kind of humanity has, has disappeared. When uh, Debussy wants to present to us in notes his own image of a, a Scottish girl, uh, La Fille au Cheveux de Lain, the girl with flaxen hair, she's static. She doesn't move. She has no heart, no soul. She's a thing. Music has become capable of representing things. Even a work like Debussy's La Mer, which is supposed to represent the sea, represents it in a very stylized Japanese way. And once you get over that particular phase of music being close to a big idea, such as the breakdown of an empire, the breakdown of an individual psyche, or the capacity to represent the outside world in a very static form, where do you go? You go, I think, uh, as with Stravinsky, uh, back to Handel, Bach, neoclassicism. There's nothing to say in any language which the 20th century presents. And this situation, I fear, has gone on. If you take possibly the most important European composer of today, Pierre Boulez, he's written much, not enough. He doesn't know where to go. We don't know what sort of language music is anymore. And it's probably for that reason that we all desperately rush to a non-musical attribute which is attached to the music and makes the music make sense. Thank God we've had the cinema in which music accompanies scenes and music seems to mean something. If we're representing in a film a man drinking a Coca-Cola because he's thirsty, we cannot use the Schoenbergian technique. There's no neurosis there. There's a very simple satisfaction of thirst. Some people have tried to say that if music is a language, it ought to be able to communicate as any other language does, whether it's a, a natural language, an artificial one, like a computerese. And uh, in consequence, they've said, look, a word is made up of sounds. The word cat is made up of three phonemes, k, a, t. We notice that musical chords are made up of various notes. Is it not possible that these chords are capable of being forced uh, to have meaning in the way that an ordinary language has. I mean, as, as I, I think I've already said, the word cat it only means what it does, the furry animal that chases mice, because there's a kind of general agreement that that's what it means. Is it possible to take certain chords in music and by an act of general agreement say that this means this and that means that? Let's see if it's possible. If I say that that means I, myself, I've probably chosen the right combination of notes because that is stable. I consider myself to be a stable element in the universe. If that means I, what, what does this mean? Uh, it means a deranged I, and it could possibly be used to signify some violent action appropriate to a deranged personality. So whether that means kill. I don't think nowadays it would. In the early 19th century, that chord, which was invented by Scriabin, uh, called the mystic chord, could mean kill. Nowadays, it's not powerful enough. We need something like this. And supposing, finally, that chord means wife, or my wife, what does this mean? I kill my wife. This means my wife kills me. But uh, everybody will say, look, that's not right for wife. There's no stability in it. Well, that may be appropriate. But uh, that chord called the diminished seventh can go anywhere. It won't do for wife. You need something as stable as that. So you might end up with, I kill my wife, my wife kills me. You'll never be totally satisfied with whatever you choose. Obviously, music doesn't work that way. Music doesn't work at all in the same way as language. Music relies on what language throws away. Loudness, softness, odd scraps of material, which are of no particular interest to the speaker of a language. Now, in our own day, we've seen such a terrible division, such a terrible gulf, between the two arts I've tried to practice, 
uh, that this must make anybody who's concerned with the arts rather disturbed. Music and literature are made out of the same materials. They're made out of sound, they're made out of duration. Nowadays, writers don't concern themselves much with music, although musicians who often need words concern themselves a great deal with writers. If we go back to the time of Shakespeare, there was no problem. Uh, we don't know whether Shakespeare sang in a high tenor or could play the guitar or the lute, but we do know that he knew something about music. He had to set lyrics to music, he had to write lyrics to be set to music, he had to listen to the songs sung by his uh, fellow players, who were also musicians, and curious enough, in, one, in some of his work, there are references to music which show an undoubted understanding of what the art is. Indeed, in uh, two of his plays, he actually gives us musical themes. Literary scholars are not interested. Nobody notices that in the play Love's Labour's Lost, the character Holofernes uh, comes in singing a theme. Da, 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 da. Useful theme, you could use it. But more interestingly, in the play King Lear, the character Edmund comes on singing this, four notes only. At uh, Cambridge University, a young composer called Richard Adams who studied this play and decided eventually, in wartime, to use those four notes, like this. <laughs> Uh, sort of putting the balance right. Uh, Shakespeare, well, if we take Hamlet as signifying Shakespeare's attitude to Poles, uh, was not greatly struck with them. Uh, Polonius is uh, obviously a Pole, but uh, he's rather a stupid man. Uh, Add himself put things right by making the Warsaw Concerto out of those four notes. But nobody notices this. No literary scholar that I know in the millions of words that have been written about Shakespeare has noted that Shakespeare was a kind of musician. He wrote themes. This situation broke down. The gap between music and literature became really wide in the 18th century when Dr. Samuel Johnson, who had no musical ear at all, rather despised music. You remember his biographer, James Boswell, who was a Scot and rather emotional, said, when I hear music, I want to make love to the nearest pretty woman. I, I want to rush into battle. And Johnson said, I would never hear it if it made me such a fool. <laughs> This situation went on into the 19th century when the most musical poet of them all, Algernon, Algernon Charles Swinburne, was uh, on one occasion, for a joke, played three blind mice on the piano and he was told it was an old Roman air. He said, yes, in it you can hear the cruel beauty of the Borgias. This is the situation that had arisen. Uh, W.E. Yeats was stone deaf as far as music was concerned. This may have been occasioned by the fact that a setting of his poem, The Lake Isle of Innisfree, was played by 7,000 Boy Scouts on harmonicas at a special <laughs> rally. But the, the, gap, the gap has only re really been heal healed uh, by one particular poet. And this is the poet whose centenary we celebrate this year. An American poet born in St. Louis, Missouri, who eventually became a uh, naturalized Briton, T.S. Eliot, who bridges the gap, bridges the Atlantic, and is conceivably the uh, most important poet of our day. I've got to say something now about a situation that's arisen uh, with regard to my attempt to uh, celebrate Eliot's centenary, born in 1880, uh, 1888. His widow, uh, Valerie Eliot, kindly allowed me to make a setting of the wasteland for a group in Sarah Lawrence College, cellist, oboist, flautist, soprano, and narrator. She permitted two performances only. Now she will not permit me to perform it again. She said that Tom from the Shades would not like it. Nevertheless, she's prepared to collect millions of dollars from cats. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a motive there which is, which is not quite aesthetic. In 1937, when I was an undergraduate, Eliot had no objection at all to my presenting The Wasteland as a musical entertainment. Uh, and uh, he saw that the poem only really made sense when it was attached to its musical background. Yeah, I'm not going to recite the whole poem, but I remember in 1937 as a young man opening out 
a recitation of the poem, April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, with the music of uh, Stravinsky's The Sacre du Printemps, the, the Rite of Spring, something like this. A high bassoon. It fits, and uh, in later life, Eliot admitted that he'd had that theme in mind when he wrote the opening lines. But as the poem continues, you find that there are references to Wagner, which demand the music. You know, Frisch weht der Wind der Heimat zu, mein Irish Kind wohl Frisch weht der Wind der Heimat, etc., etc. You've got to sing it. It's the opening uh, of the Tristan Isolde, where the, the, cabin, the, uh, the ship's boy on the mast is singing that song. Frisch weht der Wind, fresh blows the wind, Der Heimat zu, to the homeland, mein Irish Kind, my Irish child, wo weilers zu, where are you wandering? And a few lines later, you get li uh, a phrase sung by the shepherd boy in the third act of Tristan, Erd und leer das Meer, waste and empty the sea, Erd und leer das Meer. Obviously, Eliot is intending there to compress the whole of Tristan and Isolde into a few lines, because he's dealing with love, which is fundamentally barren a love affair out of which nothing will come, which will end in death, uh, which is not in any way concerned with stability. This goes on. And uh, Eliot, of course, being concerned with st the sterility of our age, is concerned how we can, with how we can cure that sterility. He goes back to the Grail legend, the wasteland in which no rain falls, and the only way to get the rain to fall is to find the Grail, the Holy Grail, and this will shed a benediction on the world and the rain will fall and the earth will be fructified again. But the um, bigger theme that comes in Parsifal, which of course is about the Grail legend, is something that curiously can be heard at the back of this poem. This. triple or Dresden Amen, which comes in Parsifal when the grail comes down. Uh, this has to be heard, not only when we hear the line, et oh ces voix d'enfants chantant dans la coupole, and these voices of children singing in the cupola, which is from a poem by Verlaine called Parsifal. But at the very end of the poem, when Eliot breaks into Sanskrit, and says that the only solution to our problems is data, dayatham, damyata, give, sympathize, control. He ends with a threefold amen in Sanskrit, shanti, 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 which means, so we're told, uh, the peace that passes all understanding. Imagine those lines accompanied by that Wagnerian theme from Parsifal. Interestingly, very, very interestingly, in this poem, The Wasteland, uh, Eliot is not merely concerned with the music of Wagner, although the whole thing is suffused with Wagner. When the Thames daughters appear, they're obviously the Rhine daughters. And if you try and fit the words that Eliot gives them to the music of Wagner in uh, the Rhine gold, the fit is perfect. But he is also concerned with a kind of music that doesn't reach up to those heights. Uh, one of the comic effects of the poem, which is also vaguely tragic, is when the washing of the feet in Parsifal is mentioned. Eliot suddenly breaks out into this song, which is the uh, of a lowness, uh, of a vulgarity, which I can best, best show by playing it. It's incredible the way he gets away with that. It's uh, not quite jazz, but it is demotic song, a popular idiom. And this is the only work of literature I know in which 
the higher elements of music, Wagner, and these lower elements, a popular song about Mrs. Porter washing her feet in soda water, can come together. Now, Eliot was gifted with a great ear, and he said on one occasion that the poetry of our age should be influenced by two things. It should be influenced by the rhythm of the combustion, the internal combustion engine, and it should also be influenced by the rhythms of jazz. Uh, jazz was considered by a lot of poets and artists of the 20s, even very serious artists like Stravinsky, as being the essentially 20th century idiom. And there is a little play that Eliot wrote called Sweeney Agonistes. He never finished it. He called it a fragment of an unfinished Aristophanic melodrama in which for the first time in serious literature, the rhythms of jazz are being used. The uh, effect of watching this play or hearing it is essentially jazzy in that you imagine a kind of side drum with brushes marking out the rhythm while the characters speak. It begins with a couple of girls, typists, uh, living in a London flat, and one of them, they're called Dusty and Doris, Dusty says to Doris, what about Pereira? What about Pereira? He pays the rent. Yes, he pays the rent. Well, some men don't, and some men do. Some men don't, and you know who. You can hear the jazzy rhythm going on there. Eliot was right, because jazz is perhaps the only medium of our age which is essentially honest. It's honest in the sense that it is based on the rhythms of the voice and the rhythms of the body. Uh, often the sexual rhythms of the body, that's in order because jazz has a sexual reference, the very name has a sexual reference. But in this little play, Sweeney Agonistes, Eliot goes the whole hog and introduces words that have to be set to music, whether we like it or not. Uh, there's one song called Under the Bamboo Tree, uh, which is based in its title and its theme on a song sung by Lillian Russell in the 19th century in New York. Those of you who remember the film with Judy Garland called Meet Me in St. Louis will remember that uh, she and uh, Margaret, the young Margaret O'Brien sing this song. If you like to me, like I like to you, you know, etc. Under the bam, under the boo, under the bamboo tree. This is Elliot's version. Uh, the music is mine. <laughs> In other words, popular music is being taken seriously, and there's a kind of sense in which the great mystery of what music means is being resolved, uh, not through a Schubert leader or the leader of Hugo Wolf, not through high art, but through lowly art. The secret may lie there. Now, Eliot uh, was fascinated by the old English music hall. He wrote a um, an, an essay on Mary Lloyd, who was one of the great singers whom my mother well remembers. And he said a curious thing. He said that uh, he preferred My Fair Lady uh, to uh, the original Pygmalion, on which it's based. A dangerous thing to say, because this meant that he liked this. Arabians speak Arabian with the speed of summer lightning, and Hebrews speak it backwards, which is really rather frightening. Uh, very frightening thing to say. Or again, uh, I'd be equally as willing for a dentist to be drilling than to ever let a woman in my life. Uh, Eliot uh, was flirting, flirting with popular music, popular art. Uh, remember, Eartha Kitt uh, sang a song called Monotonous, in which the words were, T.S. Eliot writes books for me, King Farouk's on tenterhooks for me. Well, Eliot timidly sent her a bouquet, but made no further contact. <laughs> he was on the right lines, nevertheless. He was on the right lines. Uh, we had a poet in England, recently dead, called... Uh, uh, called, uh, this, this is what happened in old age, uh, names disappear totally, uh, Philip Larkin, uh, who was first inspired to become a poet by the popular songs of the 30s. I know exactly the nature of this fascination. Uh, there was a song sung by Bing Crosby called Love is Just Around the Corner, and in the middle eight of this song it said, 
Venus de Milo was noted for her charms. Strictly between us, you're cuter than Venus, and what's more, you've got arms. Uh, there's another song called Mama, I Want to Make Rhythm, Don't Want to Make Music, Just Want to Go La di la di la, etc. Et so the middle eight there goes, I have no desire to carry a Stradivarius, but there's no limit of primitive tom tom in my tum tum. Uh, <laughs> this is made out of the rhythm of the music. In other words, we're learning to a certain extent what music can be about. Music can contain. Uh, not the highfalutin words of great poets, but the ordinary words of ordinary people raised to a higher level through wit, uh, through rhyme, which is witty in itself. And this tradition goes on, and it's a very important tradition in my opinion. It goes on even when you cannot remember the name of the lyrist, uh, as in the Broadway musical Bye Bye Birdie, which was made into a film, a song called Put On A Happy Face, which has the brilliant lines, take off the gloomy mask of tragedy, it's a mass, sorry, take off the gloomy mask of tragedy, it's not your style, take off and zoom, now aren't you glad you decided to smile? That's clever. Uh, you don't find that in more intellectual poetry. And I would say this, and uh, this very nearly brings me to a kind of conclusion that uh, we ought to pay very, very special attention uh, to the products of Broadway. Uh, one of the great poets of this century, I think Bud Schulberg said he ought to be America's poet laureate, was, uh, was uh, Lawrence Hart. Lawrence Hart wrote with Richard Rogers a great number of scores for Broadway musicals. These scores are brilliant. The lyrics that Hart produced are a kind of literature close to the heart, close to the people, close to ordinary speech, and close to what music is essentially about, the glorification of speech. This is the area in which Eliot should have dug a little and probably seen a poet whose technique was conceivably greater than his own. Uh, the lyrics are simple. You know, we'll have Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island too. It's lovely going through the zoo. That's brilliant. Or in uh, Yankee at the Court of King Arthur, thou swell, thou pretty, all I, what I want is uh, uh, just a plot of, not a lot of land, and thou swell, thou pretty, thou grand. The brilliance of taking a throwaway word like and and involving it in a musical scheme, because the music comes first. And yet, at the same time, the music tells you that there are verbal possibilities which only a genius can bring out. We, in our mountain greenery, where God paints the scenery, just two happy people together, beans will get no keener reception in a beanery. Bless our mountain greenery home. This is a tradition which is probably still going on with Stephen Sondheim, uh, but is dying and is probably dead in music not produced on Broadway. I mean popular song rock music and the like, is not concerned with lyrical vigor, not concerned with much with musical vigor either, but this was a region which was Broadway's own, which was America's own, and which tells us a great deal of what is lying in the rhythms of ordinary music. If we study music a little more deeply than we do, we'll see that we can only understand poetry, even the greatest poetry, by considering that it is a kind of music. It's based on the same kind of rhythms, it's always struck me that there's been something wrong for many centuries in supposing that the blank verse of William Shakespeare was a high achievement. It was not a high achievement, so some would say. But when Ben Jonson spoke about Christopher Marlowe's mighty line, he knew what he was saying. Because Marlowe instinctively knew that five beats to a line was impossible in popular music. You only hear five beats to the bar in a very few pieces of music, like the um, second movement of Tchaikovsky's Pathetic Symphony in Host's Planets depicting Mars, a distortion of body rhythm, a distortion of the beat of the heart. The body doesn't work in five beats. It works in four or two beats. It's a duple rhythm. But Marlowe knew this. And Marlowe knew that when he wrote a line of five beats, he was really writing a line of four beats and an unspoken line beginning with a spoken beat, rather like this. 
In Naples did I learn to poison flowers. Two, three, four. There's the mighty line. There's a pause after it. There's a stop. And when Faustus meets Helen, was this the face that launched a thousand ships? Two, three, four. And burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Two, three, four. Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. Two, three. You can get a kiss in there. Get three kisses in. I will be Paris, etc. Shakespeare never really knew the lesson. Uh, when we praise Shakespeare, or people do, for the brilliance of his final blank verse, where lines run over into each other, we're getting towards prose, whether we like it or not. Music was in Marlowe, and that explains the mighty line. To be or not to be, that is the question, two, three, four. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer to, that's all right. But that suffer requires you to get onto the next line as quickly as you can. Probably the, the final achievement in relating music to poetry was made by the Jesuit priest who died just 100 years ago next year. That was Gerard Manley Hopkins, who died of cholera in Dublin, but saw that there was a relationship between music and poetry, which no other poet had been willing to bring out. Uh, let's put it this way. In um, Eliot's Sweeney Agonistes, you have the little song, My Little Island Girl, My Little Island Girl, I'm going to stay with you and we won't worry what to do. We won't have to catch any trains and we won't go home when it, when it rains. We'll gather hibiscus flowers and it won't be minutes but hours, they said, and the morning and the evening and noontime and night, four beats. You can shorten those, morn, eve, noon, night. You can lengthen them in the morning, during the afternoon, in the, in the evening, uh, after the night. You can add as many syllables as you like, or take as many syllables away as you like, so long as you have that basic beat. And this, of course, is what Hopkins did, uh, producing lines with as many as 20 syllables in, and then other lines with as few as five, bringing music close to literature and showing what the essential relationship is. And yet, of course, we are left with music separated from words, which doesn't always make us happy. We are happier when music is related to an image, an idea, or to words. I'd like to play you, if I may, very briefly, um, just a few bars uh, from a work I had performed in Geneva uh, less than a month ago. Um, it was performed by the Orchestre Suisse Romande, or rather with some members of it. They were all Americans. Uh, you will be proud to know that uh, the great leaders of uh, European orchestras are all American. And nobody can touch the Americans for technique. Uh, give the piece I'm going to play to you now to the orchestra of the Scala Milan, and they wouldn't be able to play it. Let's see what it sounds like. They're shooting up. <coughs> I hope.
the hell does this mean? Well, the work itself is called Mr. Burgess's Almanac. Almanac spelled with a K. And uh, the Corriere della Sera in Milan sent their chief music critic down to assess the music. And uh, he caught on to the title, Mr. Burgess's Almanac, and assumed it was about the running of the year. Uh, that opening is rather meditative. We haven't really got started yet. The uh, composer is thinking about what to say, but when the fast movement begins, ah, oh, that will do very well for January. You know, winds, harsh, bitter, chill. And of course, uh, the uh, critic ended up by talking about the Four Seasons by Vivaldi and so on and so forth. Uh, this shows you the danger of giving anything a title at all. Uh, it was called Mr. Burgess's Almanac because there are 12 movements in it. And uh, it's a curious fact, probably a coincidence, there are 12 months in the year and 12 notes in the chromatic scale. And all I'd done was to take the 12 possible intervals of the chromatic scale. Minor second, major second, minor third, major third, fourth, and so on. And uh, based each little movement on one or other of these intervals. That is the only sense in which it was an almanac at all. You can always get people to take the wrong road by giving a piece of music a title. What I should have called it was music number 12 or uh, variations for wind group or something of that kind. The critic would have been unhappy. Every critic needs some kind of guide because he can't write about music without invoking literature, reality, nature. It's rather like writing about wine. You can't write about wine, technically. You can only say this wine has a great bouquet, there's a faint strawberry odor in this excellent uh, vintage, and so on. And uh, if you write about music at all, you are always led into the path of metaphor. So I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that we need music, we desperately need it, we cannot live without it. It's a great uh, sustentive mystery, but we have no idea at all what it's trying to say. And I think the same may be said of literature. We're not quite sure what literature is trying to do. I remember thinking some of these thoughts over in France last year. It was on July the 14th, and uh, the local band was celebrating the, the breaking into the Bastille. Uh, they would play the Marseillaise. And uh, the opening notes of the Marseillaise, as you know, da 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 are supposed to symbolize awakening. Fine, let's accept that. But there's a symphony by Sibelius, number five in E-flat, which begins in the same way. Da, 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 da. A symphony by Vaughan Williams called the London Symphony, which begins in the same way. Da, 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 da. All right, that will do for awakening. In uh, Vaughan Williams' symphony, the city is awakening, you hear Big Ben, the day begins. But there's a little song by uh, your great New York composer and conductor, uh, Leonard Bernstein, uh, which also begins with those notes. New York, New York, it's a hell of a town. We do not know what music means. Thank you very much. We have a little time, ladies and gentlemen, for, for any questions or objections, or what you will. <laughs> objections, certainly. If I say, no, Mozart was the last of the great composers, you're certainly prepared to object to that. Nevertheless, sir. Yes, I understand you have an opera about Ulysses. An opera? Uh, an opera, written about, based on Ulysses. Yes, I wrote, uh, I wouldn't call it an opera, I would call it a kind of Broadway musical on uh, Ulysses. This, this was for Joyce's. Centennial, 1982. Uh, it was called Blooms of Dublin. Uh, this was meant to evoke, you know, the Coins and the Kellys, Abe's Irish Rose, uh, which ran for. You remember the, uh, you remember uh, again um, Lawrence Hart's lyric, you know, about Manhattan. Our future babies will take to Abe's Irish Rose. We'll hope to live. They, we hope they live to see it close. Um, it was an attempt to, uh, you know, it, it was a popular work. In other words, it. it uh, 
Joyce was telling me, in a sense, to make a musical out of it because he has three major characters. Two of them are singers. Uh, Stephen Dedalus is a tenor and Molly Bloom is a professional soprano. And I don't doubt that uh, uh, Leopold Bloom, who is you know, half Hungarian Jewish, has a kind of baritone useful for a cantor. Uh, it seemed to me that Joyce was spelling it out. You know, here is the story. It's not much of a story but try and make a musical out of it. Of course, the fury of the literati was intense, the fury of the intellectuals. <laughs> but uh, we, we, we put this on, on, um, uh, on the BBC, over the BBC and uh, Radio Televise Iran on the same evening. Uh, it was extremely difficult to do. When we arrived in Dublin, you know, it was a kind of friendly gesture to record it in Dublin, where, in fact, the recording facilities were very primitive. We found that nobody was willing to go ahead with this. Everybody was on strike. They said, you know, Joyce, you know, this dirty man who lived with a woman, not his wife, and left the church, etc. His dirty language. And the man said, have you read a bloody thing at all? It's full of fucking filth. <laughs> but uh, uh, we got it across. And uh, then there was, a, there, was a, there was an attempt to uh, put it on here in America, in Baltimore. Uh, so I, I'd written the original score for a fairly large orchestra. Uh, and um, in, for the American production, I you know, reduced the orchestra greatly to a few. But then finally, in Baltimore, they said they couldn't put it on. And you know why? It's always that moment in Ulysses where language breaks down, where the two British soldiers knock down Stephen Dedalus and use this filthy language, and I'll wring the blasted, bleeding fucking neck of any bastard that's a fucking word against my fucking king. <laughs> I'm only quoting. Um, <laughs> they wouldn't allow this, but of course, if you get rid of that, if you soften it, you're losing the whole impact of... Uh, of Joyce's language, so the thing has never been done on the stage. Uh, the uh, strike was terrible. Uh, the, uh, you know, finally, the trade union said, you've got to perform, you can't reject uh, this commission on purely moral grounds. And uh, the musician said, I will play, but we won't play well. And by God, they didn't. Yes, this was done, but I, don't, I think it would be stupid to make an opera out of you, this. It's too much... Uh, a book for the people. You know, it's a book about ordinary people. It's a demotic book. It's not a highbrow book at all, uh, despite the language and the difficulties. The Joyce was a man of the people. It's a book about cups of tea and pork pies, you know, walking the streets of this filthy city. And that's what I tried to produce in this work. Yes, it has been now. If you care to borrow the score sometimes, it's in four volumes. <laughs> no, it takes three hours. It's, it's a three-hour job with two acts. It falls very neatly into place. Uh, Joyce obviously had this in mind. <laughs> Joyce. No, to, to, well, to complete the story, the, the, uh, the job was first done, it was first begun in New York in 1971. Uh, uh, it was for uh, the great Zero Mostel, who wanted to play, sing the part of Bloom. He would have been ideal for the job, although he was already a little too old, you know. He was already over 60, and uh, Bloom is only 38. And when he died, of course, the, the whole notion fell to the ground. I wanted Topol to do it. Topol might have done Bloom rather well. But we ended up with uh, the young man who uh, appeared in uh, John Huston's film, The Dead, you know, his last film, the man who plays Gabriel Conroy, the young Irish actor, Donald, Donald McCann. That's a good question. Thank you. Shows that I have been trying to write a bit of, trying to write a bit of music occasionally. Sir. Mr. Burgess, as a man who's been a novelist and a symphonic composer, mm -hmm. what is the more uh, laborious craft? What is the greater intellectual, the greater tax of, of one's brain? I think the greater, the greater taxing of the brain comes with writing even a simple sentence. Uh, but uh, the physical labor of writing music is intense. If you look at those two fingers, you know, they're, they're coming apart because I've handled a music pen most of my life. Uh, the writing of a full orchestral score is a physical labor that is quite exhausting. And it is misleading. The work you do is misleading. You feel you've done a lot of work in writing a single page, you know, all the instruments all the way down from flutes down to double basses, 30 lines. And uh, when you kind of play it over, of course, it's only, the duration is only about five seconds if it's in a fast tempo. The labor of writing music doesn't seem to be commensurate with the, with the result, if you see what I mean. You can sit down and, and type out a novel, and uh, you're only dealing with monody, you're only dealing with one line, you know, one line of melody. 
and uh, of course in music you're dealing with several. Uh, what my aim has been, and uh, I, I think I'm probably too old now to fulfill it, is to make literature behave like music. And I think that uh, James Joyce achieved this in Finnegan's Wake, you know, where uh, I think, as I've said before, the words never say more than ne always say more than one thing. You know, there was a kind of counterpoint. Uh, the words are chords. You know, this word crops. Uh, the simplest example: C R O P S E, where you get, you know, in a single word, you get the, the notion of a corpse and the notion of crops uh, coming out of the corpse. Uh, Joyce probably went too far because the book is to many people unintelligible, but it obviously had to be done. And I think this was really a musical effort to make words behave like music. And of course, Hopkins did the same thing in a slightly smaller way. You know, there's a, a line in Hopkins uh, which goes like this, which treads through prick-proof, thick, thousands of forms, thoughts, I feel sure if Joyce had taken over that line, he would have not put thorns, thoughts, he would have put thorns. Uh, see, that's the difference between the two. But obviously, Hopkins was working towards it, trying to uh, pretend that thorn and thought were really the same word, because they were close to each other. In other words, producing a chord, or he needed a kind of counterpoint. How do you account for the fact that both Hopkins and Joyce were Jesuit? It's quite incredible. It's, quite, it's totally incredible. It's a total coincidence. Uh, Joyce was only seven when uh, Hopkins died. Hopkins died in Dublin, where Joyce was living as a young boy. He died, in fact, at UCD, uh, University College Dublin, where Joyce was to be a, a student. I don't think the name meant anything to Joyce. I think in later life he said uh, he'd read Hopkins. I don't believe it. He said he had. He said he was a kind of English mad army, back to Debussy. I don't think it's true. He, and yet they both really took the same path. Uh, it may have been something to do with the same quality of mind. I think uh, the Jesuitical mind may have had something to do with it. The extreme logic of the Jesuits, you know, pushing uh, an artistic form as far as you possibly could. In other words, logic going all the way. But it, it, I, I prefer to regard it as a queen. They didn't know each other. They never, never really knew each other. Joyce's you know, mature style was already formed by the time Hopkins' poems were published in 1918. Well, the, 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 Ithaca, the Ithaca chapter, where life is reduced to question and answer, yeah. Well, that was Joyce's favorite chapter, as you know. It was the, it was the ugly, duck, ugly duckling of the chapter, where he was trying to show that scientific investigation told you nothing about human personality. That, you know, you ask these questions, what did they do then? And, all oh, right, Bloom turned the tap, what happened? And so it goes on. Uh, a whole page of the water coming from the reservoir in Wicklow all the way to Dublin. It tells you nothing about the making of a cup of cocoa or, or a bloom himself. But there comes a moment, doesn't there, in, the, in that question and answer where, where Joyce can't help himself. The, uh, Stephen and Joyce go out into the back garden to urinate and they look up at the stars and what do they see? The question, what, do they, what did they see? The heaven tree of stars hung with humid night blue fruit. Joyce couldn't help it. At that moment, poetry comes back. Only for a moment. Then we're back to this relentless grind of question and answer. I quite agree with you. But it had to be there, I think, just to show, you know, negatively, negatively in a sense, what questions could not really be asked about people. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, sir. Yes, please. I, I can't see you. Where are you? When you, uh, when you say that oh, yes. has no meaning, yes. Uh, I mean that, uh, as I've tried to indicate, there may be a, a whole a tremendous potentiality of meaning, uh, which is best indicated you know, in the popular song, that uh, if you gave Larry Hart, if Rogers gave Hart a piece of music, Hart would recognize the latent words in it, uh, which of course were only one of several possible choices, but the kind of rhythm of words, the stress of words, was already contained in the sense of the music. Uh, when I say it means nothing, I, I, I think I mean what I say. Uh, we can attach, you know, through association, meanings to it, uh, by, uh, through a title or, or through a film or, or, or through uh, uh, a setting, a uh, poetical setting. But you can't say that music means this, that, or the other because it doesn't function like ordinary language. Uh, I used to say that music was really about 
a series of tensions and releases. You know, it is in Bach, you know, you get a, a discord, which is a tension, resolving itself into a release. But in the present day, thanks to Schoenberg, this is no longer possible, because Schoenberg made no distinction between concords and discords. Uh, no discord was worse than any other discord. A discord could not be used as Beethoven had used it, you know, immediately to wake you up a little, to make you feel tense, then suddenly to resolve it onto a concord, and so, you know, it resolved at the same time the tension. That's what music used to be about. I also used to think that music was really a representation of the human brain, that it is pure structure, and uh, explains partly why we're able to structure the world outside us at all. I know. I, well, I think I've already mentioned this. You know that we we structure the uh, the rainbow. We structure the spectrum by taking colours from it and giving arbitrary meanings to these colours. You know, red in a traffic signal and green in a traffic signal. And in the same way, you know, we take sounds from the air. You know, sounds made by the voice and structure those into phonemes, which oppose each other. You know, cat, bat, and so on. And let's get a language. But I don't think music does that. I wish I knew the answer, but I, I, I think to be honest, to be absolutely candid, I have to say that music has no meaning, except itself. It's self-referential. It refers to itself. But we're so unhappy about that that we have to put a meaning to it by adding words, or by adding a title, or by associating it with a cinematic image. Sir. Uh, sorry, uh, madame. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. My first response is intellectual and then emotional. Mm. And I think the meaning of music is, is emotional primarily. The same, it seems to me that music is the same chord, the same song, can affect a four year old child mm. and a six year old man in the same way. Well, I accept that, but it's, I still don't know why it's emotional. Uh, one can, I mean, there are whole books written about this problem, but some say that uh, our basic capacity to enjoy music is something to do with being in our mother's womb. Uh, where we heard the maternal heartbeat, which of course, you know, the beat is the, the, beat is the basis of music. Even, you know, it's rock music knows very well. And uh, a kind of rumbling, a kind of comforting rumbling sound, which had nothing to do with emotion as such, it had more to do with a feeling of security. Uh, perhaps music gives us a feeling of security, but, o but only because of that early, early association. I mean, I'm, this, I'm not putting this forward frivolously. I mean, this is, a, you know, quite serious. Uh, hypothesis that uh, it all goes back to the womb. So many things do. But I'm not prepared to say, you know, what a, what a Beethoven symphony means. I, I'm prepared to say that a Haydn or a Mozart symphony is an image of order, an image of the order of a particular social structure. And uh, it is close to the dance. You know, the fact the third movement of a Mozart symphony is always a minuet is that is as though he's reminding us that we're going back to the dance. But when Beethoven gets onto the scherzo, no more minuets, uh, where he changes tempo, changes dynamics, uh, we're obviously in the presence of a personality. And I'm not sure whether this is right for music. I think music is a more social art than a, uh, as it were, an idiosyncratic art. It, it, it's not, it doesn't come out of the individual so much as out of the society. But I may be wrong. Yeah. Sir, I, I, if I, do you mind, this gentleman? Yes, yeah, sir. I, I come back to uh, one thing. I think it's interesting that Mendelssohn, mm -hmm. just at the time, just a little after the time when you said that uh, music changed it, yes. became attached to outside objects, I think it was he who said that people say uh, that music loses uh, meaning is too imprecise. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But for him, uh, the truth was exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. The meaning of music is so precise yeah. that there are no words that, that you can express it. Yes, I agree with that to some extent, except, of course, he can't, he can't articulate the nature of the precision. Uh, he can't put it into words. He can only appreciate it musically. Music is self-referential. It refers to itself. It's only by wrenching it that we can make it refer to other things. Uh, by adding words to it or making it accompany a scene or a, a set of ballet steps or something of that kind. It is precise in the sense that uh, the structure of music is not arbitrary. 
Words are arbitrary. This is the whole point. You remember, so see it again. Words are arbitrary and inert. There's no reason why cat should mean cat and no reason why dog should mean dog. We could reverse the meanings, and if we all accepted it, language would go on quite happily. But music is precise in the sense that it means what it means. But what it means, of course, cannot be put into words. Yeah, indeed it is. It, it may indicate you know, the total limitations of uh, spoken language. Whether we could, uh, as it were, totally eliminate language, you know, spoken language and written language from our world and, uh, and communicate through music, I don't know. I don't think we could. Interesting idea. <laughs> and of course, opera comes very close to it because nobody, I think, can hear the words in opera. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, Madame. Uh, we would not consider literature an expression, and would not lyrics then be considered an expression and extension of our friends? Are we not talking about communication? Then are we not considered? Yes, we are. You're right. We are talking about communication. Yes. Consider music an expression as well as literature. Yes. Well, all art is communication, but again, we're not quite sure what the nature of the communication is. Now, this is why you know philosophers have uh, brought out aesthetic systems which contradict each other. I don't think there are any aesthetic systems nowadays, but any you know full-grown philosopher like Schopenhauer or Kant or Hegel felt it was his duty to bring out an aesthetique that tells what the arts were trying to do. We're not getting anywhere nearer to it. So I can't get closer myself uh, than to the you know the old notion that uh, the nature of ultimate reality is. Uh, beauty, truth, and goodness. Uh, I'm not too happy about truth, and I'm not too happy about goodness, but I'm fairly happy about beauty. I can't define beauty. Oh, I can say that it's the disposition of parts to make a harmonious whole, whatever that means. But if a God, if, if there is a God, if God exists, he's best thought of in terms of beauty. That ultimate reality is probably closer to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony than to a, a proposition by Wittgenstein. That if God exists, uh, God is probably a, an infinite orchestra playing an infinite Beethoven's Ninth Symphony to himself, forever and ever. And I think at that, I think at that point, I think, I think I'd better stop. I'm getting into deep waters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. 